that we need. We're missing Darcy and Pat, but Pat won't be joining us. And Darcy, I thought was going to, but she might have been a an if an if she was available. She does child care on Tuesdays. Yeah, so it, it might have been an if. Okay, so we are recording. Thank you, Athena. You're welcome. You're all set. Excellent. So we are going to start. Um, so it is 2.04 in the afternoon and seeing a quorum of the Community Resources Committee, I am calling the uh, joint meeting. It is a special meeting of the Town Council and a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee to order for September 15th, 2020. Uh, Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGL chapter 30A, section 20, allows us to hold this virtual meeting of both the Community Resources Committee and the Town Council. The meeting is being recorded for future broadcast and any votes we take will be by roll call. Um, at this time, I'm going to call on the CRC members by name to make sure the Community Resources Committee members and uh, can hear me and we can hear you. Then I will hand the gavel, virtual gavel over to Lynn um, to call the town council meeting to order and do the same for the non-CRC council members um, before we move into the agenda. So for now, CRC members, Shalini Balmilne. Present. Um, and then it's Mandy Johanneke is present and then it's Evan Ross. Present. Uh, Steve Schreiber. Here. And Sarah Swartz. Present. Okay, that is CRC called to order with all five members present. Lynn. Okay, given that we have a quorum of the full council here on the, the joint meeting with CRC, it's um, calling the meeting to order at 2.06. I'm gonna call your name, please answer and say you're present. So Lynn Griesmer is present. Andy Steinberg. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. And Alyssa uh, Brewer. Present. I believe that's it. Excellent. So now we will move on to presentation and discussion items to give a brief background before we start. Um, this is a special meeting of the Town Council and a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee. There is public comment built into the special town council portion of the meeting at the end or in the middle of the presentation and discussion items. There is no general public comment built into the town council portion of the meeting. CRC, since it is a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee, once the town council adjourns, will entertain general public comment on other Community Resources Committee matters if there is any additional public comment at that time. Um, and then CRC will move on to regular other business it has to do. This first portion will take the bulk of the meeting um, through to about 3.45 p.m. to allow CRC to do its minor business and end by four is the goal in timing. I just wanna say this is a start of a discussion. We're not here to try and make final plans today on priorities. This is the very first discussion of this. We're here to hear um, from the planning department, from the planning board, and from counselors and the public uh, to begin a discussion on what we might concentrate on for giving the planning department some guidance for where to concentrate staff time as it relates to zoning. Um, the planning department will present their views on zoning and where they believe the most needed revisions and study and fixes and all and what, what they hope to do are. And then we will hear from the planning board chair to summarize the conversations and reasonings from the planning board that led to the memo that is in the packet and the three broad priorities they voted on. When we get to the council discussion, we'll have time to discuss and ask questions. I would hope we can stick to broader topics um, rather than say specific, specific remedies. Um, for example, if you think parking is a problem, maybe it's parking overlay district needs discussed, but not may, not potentially we need to either eliminate it or we need a park payment in lieu of clause or this or that. We're trying to figure out where we might have some large agreement for changes that we might want to see. Um, obviously there's some give and take in there. 
Um, once we have a brief discussion, we'll go to a public comment, then we'll come back to discussion and we'll try and also figure out what the next steps need to be um, and where we go from here. I'll also be taking notes on the priorities. We have a started document of compiled priorities. We will continue to add to that document today with CRC member priorities, as well as any other counselors that did not have a chance to submit. And I will work on adding to that, making it more comprehensive and publishing it at the next time we take up this topic. Um, I've also received emails from the public and town committee members on their thoughts. Hopefully we will have a chance to discuss how to deal with that, um, track those items and solicit more. Um, at this time then, I welcome Christine Brestrup and Rob Mora for the planning department presentation. And I also wanna welcome Benjamin Brager, uh, also part of the planning department and you may do your screen share when needed and let's, let's get on to what we're all here to discuss. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank, so, yeah, thank you. Um, so um, uh, I thought we'd uh, catch up a little bit for where we left off after a long delay uh, back in uh, February and March. Uh, we were uh, we visited the CRC and the planning board and began our discussions about the idea of uh, going through a comprehensive review of the bylaw and looking for uh, improvements and adjustments uh, throughout the, the document. Uh, we had what we felt was a really uh, start to a really good plan. Uh, we, we presented breaking it down into essentially three, three types of uh, uh, adjustments or amendments, uh, those that would be uh, performed mostly by staff uh, in preparation to prepare for either the zoning subcommittee or CRC review which would take, take care of things like inconsistencies and just errors throughout the bylaw and maybe adjust some of those smaller items that we deal with day to day, but uh, don't necessarily um, require a larger discussion uh, for each item. Uh, and then, you know, then we would be working on uh, bigger items, more substan uh, substantial changes to the bylaw with the CRC and planning board, uh, whether it be uh, the signage regulations, the downtown uh, mixed use uh, building standards, uh, there's so many. Uh, and then we were also looking at possibly consultant uh, work, engaging consultants to deal with some of the, the really bigger uh, items that uh, need a lot of uh, public participation and, and guidance. Uh, so, you know, that's where we left off. We never really moved to the next, uh, the, the, the next step back then. Uh, in the past few weeks, we've started working on, uh, on things and I wanna show you um, a little bit about that. Uh, then uh, we'll share his screen here and I just wanna talk a little bit, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, but uh, these are pieces of our existing bylaw. And Ben, whenever you're ready, if you do, can just scroll through, this is Article mm -hmm. 3, our use regulations. And you'll see that he'll come across some highlighted sections and uh, what you'll notice uh, throughout the document are um, confusion with just the simple formatting and numbering. So in this particular example, we have our section number, subsection, subsections one through four. And if we keep going, uh, we'll see other, other variations of that. Uh, there's another section. And then as we keep going, you might see a, um, an uppercase A. You might see a lowercase A you might see Roman numerals and lettering. So there's just a real mix of style of, of kind of layout to, throughout the bylaw. Um, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this unless there's questions as we go along, uh, but we want to go through and really clean all of that up. In this particular section coming up on the screen right now, uh, this is an example of the language referencing another section incorrectly. So we're talking about coverages and that section sends you to a height provision. So just an error, just, an, you know, just a problem with the bylaw uh, that makes it uh, more challenging to use day to day. Uh, you can go ahead and keep moving along there, Ben. Um, uh, right here, we're talking uh, design standards. I just wanted to mention design standards. This is an article seven. This is our parking requirements. There's no doubt a big discussion that's going to occur about parking, everything from you know, municipal parking to the parking for private businesses and residential uses needs to be looked at uh, for sure during this process. But 
little things that we deal with every single day. Um, and if you keep going, Ben, you know, when we look at driveway standards, the widths of the driveway, driveways, the access to them, we're constantly uh, receiving comment from the fire department that our bylaw doesn't provide the space that's needed for the equipment that we own and need to uh, have available to access a building or a site in the, in the event of an emergency. So we'll be looking at those sections to make adjustments there. Uh, a little further down, Ben, there's this uh, section uh, oh, right there, accessory uses. So this section refers us to another section that only really deals with large commercial type uh, vehicles, but it implies maybe more parking for accessory uses. Accessory uses can be a residential apartment, an accessory dwelling unit, it could be a home occupation, uh, but uh, this section is either unnecessary and should be dealt with some other way or just incomplete. So we want to we want to work on a section like that. Uh, common driveways uh, again, fire department access is a common uh, matter that we deal with throughout the year. We want to we want to work with the fire department, make sure we have uh, the regulations in line with their equipment needs. This last section in in the parking standards uh, has to do with creating a common drive. Uh, there are slope width length uh, limitations to common drives. And those in this section are reviewed by the planning board. Now it's very common and in, in, in actually in most cases that a common drive is accompanied by an application to create flag lots. And the flag lots are something that's reviewed and approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals. But in this one instance with the common drive, it's something that is reviewed by the planning board. So that requires an applicant to go through both hearing uh, both boards for both hearings and uh, you know have two separate uh, processes for uh, review and approval for the same project, uh, which is just uh, you know inefficient and unnecessary. So that's something you know we'd like to look at. Um, again, I'm just pointing out the types of things that we would like to start working on uh, in, in our first uh, review of the bylaw. The demolition delay here coming up, Article 13. This is an, a, a good example of a conflict that we've dealt with for years. Uh, right on the same page, a couple paragraphs apart. Uh, one section asks us to follow the, uh, the advertising and notice requirements uh, in accordance with 40A, the, the Zoning Act, uh, like we would for special permits. And a couple lines down, it's not less than seven days. So. Uh, if you are familiar with the special permit requirements, it's 14 days. It's a mandatory 14 days. So that's just a point that often causes confusion and um, adds to the extended time that it takes to uh, uh, see projects through the approval process. Uh, we can keep going then. Um, there's no doubt we need uh, to work on our graphics. Uh, many of these are hand drawn. They've been around a really long time. Uh, some of them cause still create questions that have never been answered and, and you know, we're faced with interpretation every day. Uh, fences is one of those examples shown on that bottom image. So we want to work on those and make, you know, make those clearer and more useful and probably more of them. The last image and then we'll wrap up about the existing bylaw is uh, this is a, 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 a shot of our use table, Article 3. Uh, one very simple formatting uh, matter is that you have to turn the bylaw sideways to read it. Uh, so whether it's digital format or, or paper format, uh, it's something we'd like to change, uh, make it uh, read and appear better. I pulled this section because it's uh, subdividable dwellings. It's actually a bylaw section that's never been used in my time here. In fact, I can only see that it was created to address one particular situation in town. Uh, 25, 30 years ago, uh, really doesn't serve any purpose, probably something we would suggest eliminating. Uh, but uh, it's a good example of a lot of criteria uh, being put into the use table, making it hard to read, hard to understand. And, um, you know, it just creates another place where, whether it's a, an attorney or developer or homeowner looking for the rules, uh, not knowing that some of it might be here and some of it might be in one of the other sections of the bylaw. Uh, so that just, uh, just gives you a, a kind of a, a sense of the type of things that we would be looking at through um, that first level review 
um, not really making big changes yet, but really getting the bylaw into a condition that's ready to start to, for us to start making those changes. And if we're ready to continue, um, I'll ask Ben to move along into uh, what he has started working on to reformat the bylaw. Now we decided that we, we want people to still recognize the bylaw and know that it's the Amherst bylaw. So we're not proposing um, a completely different look, but uh, enough of a look to make it feel uh, fresh and new and, um, and some basic changes to formatting. Mm -hmm. And we'll let Ben talk more about what he's, uh, what he started to do here. Yep. Yeah, certainly. So the past uh, few weeks, maybe, uh, two, maybe like one or two months, I've been working on reformatting the entire zoning bylaw. Um, and so I, this page that you see here is basically just the outline of what the new formatting looks like. Um, so there's, you know, adding a colored uh, banner on the header and the footer um, that tracks the uh, article title and the section title. Um, and then basically new, just very standardized um, headings uh, and indents um, for each uh, different heading as you move through the bylaw, because right now there's a lot of inconsistencies in the current bylaw with how uh, numbering and lettering is done. Um, you end up with these very long chains of numbers, like 3.24578, and uh, now this kind of uh, format that I um, am working with kind of has maximum of like, you know, three numbers in a row and then it moves into uh, A's, B's, um, or not capital letters and then um, Roman numerals and then finally lowercase letters. There's only a few instances where it gets down to this heading five. Um, so this is kind of a, you know, the, an overview of the formatting. Um, and, and now I'll show you basically um, what the bylaw looks like. So, you know, this is section one, um, or sorry, article one, article two is the zoning districts. Um, as you move down, I guess article three is where it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, and the other thing I did too was, um, you know, throughout the bylaw, there are uh, references to other sections um, of the bylaw. So, you know, as, as I went through and changed the entire numbering system, I had to go through and change uh, the references um, throughout the bylaw. And I also made them active links so you can um, click them. It'll, you know, bring you to um, the place in the bylaw that you need to go. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to think. It was basically a, a means to make it easier to work with um, and standardized throughout because um, the previous bylaw is very hard to follow and you get lost in those long number chains. Um, so this, uh, obviously I didn't, I didn't make any substantive changes um, to any of the uh, wording or language, um, merely just a reformatting um, and changing of the, the numbering system. So anytime there's a reference to another um, section changing that uh, link in the bylaw. So, yeah. Thank you, ben Benjamin. Um, we've got a couple of hands, so I have a feeling they might be questions for you. So, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, one thing I just comment when you're showing things that are in print, um, on my screen it's microscopic, so maybe uh, okay. it be a little bit bigger. Thank you. Yep. But, um, I haven't looked really carefully at the way the numbering works in the zoning law in terms of if you add one more thing to it, is it a couple decimals to the right or the left um, and how that works, you know, if you think of future changes as you're going through this. But one of the things we noticed in the general bylaws when we were going to add something to a section, and Mandy has worked with this, uh, that related to one particular one. The, nu the numbering is not completely logical in the way most people would think. Like you might think 340 is a higher number than 339, but it's not always, um, mm -hmm. you know, because whether you think about it as a decimal point. So if you pick up any anomalies like that, so just, you know, whether it's using decimal point, you know, a decimal point to make, we're still in section 32, but this is 0.0 whatever. Mm -hmm. um, 
just be aware of it because it was difficult to figure out how to add something in the right place without renumbering everything rather than having the numbering system allow you to add a digit or two. So as I said, I'm not sure it would apply here. Mm -hmm. And the only other comment I had on this notion of reformatting is sometimes, as I'm sure you and Rahab are both aware, sometimes reformatting or um, uh, changes uh, where something is located in a way that people are used to using the old formatting can't find it anymore. So just be really careful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, yeah. So I understand one set is Rob's were some inconsistency, literally doing track changes kind of fixing. But um, if people are used to finding it in a particular section and it has moved or the cross reference has changed and it had to change. So just uh, to be really careful for people who know this bylaw and use it all the time, of which I am not one. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathy. Lynn. Yeah. Um, my, I'm gonna, mine kind of goes along with Kathy's second point, but the reality is many of these references here are found throughout many other documents of the town. Mm, and so point. at some point, there's going to have to be an index that creates the crosswalk so that somebody looking at their deed can say, you know, it was blah, 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 and here's where it now is. Uh, that to me, that's the more complicated. Mm -hmm issue of renumbering. It's the cross-reference to other documents. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm all for, you know, getting things in some kind of logical order. I just want to make sure that we create that crosswalk. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and back to Ben and Rob and Chris. Oh, wait, one more question. Steve. All right. Hi, Ben. Hi, Steve. Uh, how are you? <laughs> Good, thanks. So maybe another comment, and I don't know if this is even possible without it going through a vote of the town council or whatever, and you can see it here. So at, at many of the points, we're going through the decimal system. So we keep adding numbers. So, so when there's a subsection, you go from 3.1, then to 3.12 or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then in other places, we're right here. Then all of a sudden, we break into this whole other thing of where we have capital A, capital so to me, this should be 3.2.8.1 general, then 3.2.8.2. So in other words, we sort of go into a, we break into a different way of organizing. And then we go capital letters, and then we go small Roman numerals. So we're sort of, we're mixing media. We're going from one kind of numbering system to, to all of a sudden to Roman numerals, to capital letters. And so, yeah, that's another one of, um, I think, uh, difficult to explain why we've done that. Thank you, Steve. Back to Benjamin, Christine, and Rob for continuing on. Mm -hmm. Ben, are you finished? Uh, yep. All right, well, I'm, I would like to talk a little about the substantive issues, and we know, you know, we've listed these again and again. Um, the planning board has a number of zoning articles that they proposed to town meeting that didn't go through for whatever reason. Among them were form-based code for North and South Amherst um, and mixed-use buildings and some changes to the parking requirements, et cetera. So um, what we're hoping to do is, you know, really dive into these substantive issues at first um, sort of chapter by chapter as Ben and Rob and I go through the bylaw, but also in larger chunks. Um, we, we know that um, the demo delay bylaw was looked at carefully over the last few years, and Ben has been working very closely with the Historical Commission, and they are almost finished with what they consider to be you know, a new and better demolition delay bylaw. So that's one whole chapter of the zoning bylaw that is almost ready to be um, considered. 
Um, we also have our uh, new flood maps that are coming, um, coming through. We've been working with uh, ACOM, our consulting firm, and FEMA on getting the flood maps ready, but now we need to um, incorporate a new section of our zoning bylaw to uh, deal with the new um, flood maps. And we, we actually just, and this is something that I've been hoping for for a long time, we actually just received um, what the state is considering a good model bylaw for municipalities. I've been uh, kind of um, thrashing around trying to find one and I've looked at various municipalities throughout the state, but we, we were finally given a model bylaw by the people at the state who work with FEMA. So that's gonna be very useful to us. So that'll probably be a whole separate section of our bylaw having to do with um, flood mapping. Um, we know that there are a lot of problems with our parking bylaw. We wrestle with this every time we have a site plan review application. Um, currently, our bylaw requires that there be two parking spaces for every dwelling unit in town across the board. And that makes sense in some places like, um, you know, potentially some of the outlying areas where you might have a family with, um, with two parents and a couple of kids and they need two cars. Um, and you would assume that they'd probably have two cars, but when you live in a more confined area and you're living in a studio apartment or a one bedroom apartment, do you really need two vehicles for um, every unit? So that's something that really is uh, kind of a vestigial um, requirement of our zoning bylaw. We also need to look at realistically how much parking is actually needed for some of our commercial uses. We don't really have updated information about that. So we're gonna need to um, examine that very carefully. We have a municipal parking district downtown that doesn't require any parking for most uses, except for, strangely enough, churches and other institutional uses, but it doesn't require parking for residential uses or some of the, or most of the commercial and retail uses. And that really needs to be looked at, especially since we've got so much more residential development downtown than we um, initially had. Um, that bylaw was uh, put forth back in the late 60s, I think, um, and it's been modified over time. But back in the late 60s, there really wasn't much development of any sort downtown. And it was an effort to encourage development and businesses without requiring parking. But that needs another look in these days. Um, another thing is our inclusionary zoning bylaw, which is Chapter 15 or Article 15 of our bylaw. Um, it's been a struggle ever since it was instituted. I think it was instituted in 2005. And there have been continual um, disagreements about what does it apply to, and um, also considerations about initially um, when we first really um, enforced it, which was I think in 2010, um, the town was very eager to, to have more development, particularly um, housing development. And um, at that time, the bylaw was interpreted as um, only applying um, to uh, uses that required special permits for the use itself. Um, since then, we've expanded the, um, the scope of the inclusionary zoning bylaw to include not only uh, special permits for uses, but also special permits for certain dimensional requirements. Um, along the way, we've realized that, um, oh, people really do like to live in Amherst. They like to develop in Amherst. And initially, we had been uh, worried about um, kind of dampening um, the ability to develop in Amherst uh, by having a stricter inclusionary zoning bylaw. And, and in the recent years, we've realized that, oh, people do um, want to develop in Amherst so much that they are willing to include affordable units in their developments. And we have, um, I think, three good examples of that now. We have the University Drive um, building that Barry Roberts built, which includes four, uh, four affordable units. We have the Aspen Heights building, which is being finished on Northampton Road that has, um, I think, 11 affordable units. And um, the other one is escaping my mind right now. But anyway, oh yeah, uh, well, we have presidential apartments, which added 54 units, and they also added uh, six affordable units. So we're getting the, the feeling that um, developers want to develop in town so much that they're willing to uh, provide these affordable units. So we need to really expand the um, 
types of development that require this affordability component. Um, in addition to that, we've struggled with the sign bylaw over the years. The sign bylaw is very confusing. It's, um, it has different parts of it that conflict with other parts, and it um, is very restrictive about what signs can be used in the downtown in particular, and also in the village centers. And what this results in is it's, it's hard to enforce, because if you actually enforce it um, strictly, uh, many retail places and commercial places would end up with very little signage at all, and they wouldn't be able to promote um, their special sales or you know, things that they consider are really important that they want to um, offer to the community. So we really have to work on our sign bylaw. And in addition to that, there was a, a Supreme Court case that passed a few years ago that um, relates to the content of, sign, of signs and what you can and can't regulate. And it's still a kind of confusing, murky, um, murky situation. So of all of the um, sections of the bylaw, we feel like that's one where we could really use some consultants to help us, whether the consultant is a lawyer or a planner or whatever, someone who really understands what the current limitations are that the Supreme Court has put on um, regulating signs. Um, other things are that we know that there's a need for housing and increased density. Um, but where should it go and how should it be built and how tall should it be and what it, should its setbacks be? I know there are some people in town who don't feel like there should be any more development, but to be realistic, there is going to be more development. And so we need to think about where we're going to put it and what should it look like and um, how big should it be, et cetera. So those are all things that we need to grapple with. And I'm sure that you're all familiar with the mixed use building conundrum. We have a mixed use building use in our bylaw, but very little describes what a mixed use building is, except that it includes residential uses along with commercial, institutional, and retail. But there's no description about how much non-residential use should be con uh, included in a mixed use building. So we end up with things that have mixed use buildings that have very minimal um, mixed use space. So those are those are certainly things that need to be dealt with. And um, we've heard a lot of complaints about footnote A, which is a component of our dimensional regulations. And footnote A has to do with certain dimensional requirements are allowed to be modified under a special permit. And um, many people think, well, you should just incorporate your dimensional requirements into your dimensional table and not have the ability to modify them via special permit. So we need to look at that as well. So those are just um, some examples of substantive issues that um, we feel really need to be addressed in our uh, zoning bylaw. So as we're going through chapter by chapter, we're going to be, um, you know, trying to um, fit in or draft um, sections that deal with these substantive issues. And as I said before, we already have some uh, bylaws that have already been written that just need to be um, brought forth again and, and see if uh, town council is willing to go along with them. And we're going to be working very closely with the um, planning board on this, of course. So I think um, I think I, I don't really need to say anything more about substantive issues, but I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Christine. Um, I just want to, for the record, note that I believe Darcy Dumont just joined us. So for the help of our minute taker, she could note that. Um, and welcome, Darcy. Um, and so I think I see we have two hands, but I think before we go to questions from the counselors, I do want to recognize our planning board chair, Jack, so that he can quickly discuss the memorandum and the planning board discussions and all, and so that then the questions can go relate to everything. So Jack. Hello, um, thank you for having us. And I was thinking, Chris, that you mentioned uh, Beacon in North Amherst has a good slug of affordable housing as well, right? I think maybe that was one you were thinking of. Um, may I answer that? Sure. Yes. So Beacon was part of a 40B application, a comprehensive permit. So as part of their application, they needed to um, provide affordable units, but they did not um, 
they were not under the jurisdiction of the inclusionary zoning bylaw. So I was trying to give examples of um, developers that voluntarily, you know, chose to develop and to include the affordable units as part of their um, permitting process. I, I shouldn't say voluntarily. They were required to include the affordable units, but they chose to um, develop even so. So that's what I was trying to get across. Thank you. Um, so uh, our understanding is the planning board was tasked to provide a you know, very limited focused um, priorities back to the CRC. <clears throat> and we've uh, discussed this within the last couple of planning board meetings, but in the meanwhile, we've also you know, gone through uh, a lot of change uh, with our staff. Um, so we have really kept things simple and, and our three bullets uh, are included uh, within the memo that you have received. And, um, you know, they essentially improve downtown zoning uh, and unlock housing development and increase diversity of the housing stock and then recodification of the zoning bylaw. I mean, th those are all real obvious and I feel like is that really helping you at all? <laughs> because those things are, are uh, you know, just, you know, given Chris Brestrup's rundown of substantive uh, issues, um, you know, they're, they're right, right there. So we did not spend a lot of time to get into the weeds with regard to more than those three general things, because I think, again, uh, Christine Gray Mullen was with us uh, as chair. Um, and we just knocked that out, those three bullets. So uh, we did add additional detail uh, within the memo that you were provided, uh, but those are just general things taken from our discussions, uh, which were cited in the third paragraph there. Um, but prior to what we were trying to do is change from a chart uh, that had you know some history, uh, Chris, what's that? I had that up here, that, that chart. The zoning priorities chart. It's yeah, the zoning priorities. Everybody yeah, sees. so it had five columns, three rows, lots of bullets in that too, but we, we kind of want to recast that. Uh, but we have a lot, a long way to go. But again, I think we're at a point where we're kind of trying to take cues from the, uh, the CRC with regard to what you want the planning board to do. And that also extends to like the zoning subcommittee, uh, which we you know decide would be on hiatus uh, until we get further, you know, uh, directives from the town council and the CRC. Um, but that's basically all I have. I thought Chris really did a good job talking about the substantive uh, issues, and um, that's all I have. Thank you, Jack. Um, we're going to go now into questions and discussions from the counselors. So um, the list I have, we're going to use the raise hand function because that's the only way I'm going to be able to keep track of things. And I will just go down the list. Kathy. Thank, thank you both. Um, I think my question is mainly to Chris, but then um, indirectly to Jack. Um, Chris, as you know, I early on, it was actually before the election for council, I started coming to that zoning subcommittee. Um, so the, the items you just listed out were there then, um, you know, and some of them had, you know, a paragraph or two underneath it. So my, my question is, um, how far did you as staff um, on, or as staff with planning board members, the subcommittee, get to things like um, defining mixed use. Because um, I actually, just before this meeting, um, or two weeks before this meeting, you know, sort of went through a bunch of other town zoning laws. And usually mixed use was to a whole development area, not necessarily to a building. But, you know, so I was looking for examples of, of what had other municipalities and or cities, not necessarily just in Massachusetts, what had they done? You know, do they say, you know, second floor should be offices, um, square footage, you know, what was done? Um, so it's, it's a question kind of going down each of them because it seemed to me when I was listening to it, 
some things were further along to be able to say, for example, this is what one might do and some were less. And then, so that's on that list and it's Jack, it's on that same colorful chart, you know, mm -hmm. where I went to a planning board meeting where people were saying, should this be blue or should it be yellow? You know, I mean, it's, does it move up in rank and are these subsets? So there started to be that discussion. Cause I, I had hoped we would be seeing some discussion memo coming up from you, you know, in the council. So it would get our juices thinking. So that's a question on that. And then I had one, it's more picky or more specific about the flood maps. We had these flood prone conservancy zoning, they're like zoning overlays. Um, and at least one that I know of up in North Amherst was because of a court case. And um, it went on the books, it was challenged and it was in. So if we have things like that, that were there for a particular reason, not just a FEMA map, but because of history, um, I think it would be useful for us to get a little history about it rather than wholesale just writing them out. I think we all want to update the flood maps, but um, there, there, that went through a whole process. Um, Dave Zomek, I think, was around for that. But anyway, it was uh, North Amherst farmers were concerned about a property near them. And if it flooded, they flooded um, issue. It was a na an affecting neighbor. So, um, it would be a request if we look at some things, um, at least give us a history of how did this ever get on the books? Um, was there a good reason for it? So the first question was more on how far we got on some of these issues. Um, and then Jack, I watched the planning board meeting with the three ABCs, the three biggies, and underneath them were a bunch of bullets. Um, things like mix, defined mixed use building was underneath it, inclusionary zoning was underneath it. And I think you made a decision not to have anything more refined than the three big areas. And I just was not sure why, because I thought some of the sub bullets made sense. They fit with Chris Bressup's list. I mean, because they, they've been things people have been talking about for a long time. So that, those are my two yeah. comments on both of yours. Yeah. So I think what happened, uh, Mandy is okay. I Perfectly speak. fine. I was going to call on you, Jack. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so I think what happened is that we, you know, for for the sake of time, we were we just wanted to come together and make some decisions, and and uh, we really, you know, again, we had so much turnover uh, in the board in the last month, that we just kind of laser focused on that. But you know, there's no doubt that we can provide, you know, a lot of detail and organize further. And we're willing to, you know, spend, uh, devote, say, half hour, 45 minutes, you know, as long as we don't go into the wee hours of night, uh, to discussing and, 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 and coming up with something that's um, going to be helpful to, to everyone. Because uh, I think we're all touching, we're, we'd all be touching the same points. Um, but we do have perspective because, you know, we're, we're, we see the projects come through, um, you know, the mixed use Thing that you mentioned that's you know it's it does need to be defined um you know the parking and all that and and so you know we speak to each of these and uh, perhaps after at the conclusion of this meeting uh the crc can come together and you know give us a little bit more of a directive because i may have missed something as, as being as the, you know, the, the vice chair about exactly what you wanted. But all I know is like, we just got, <laughs> we wanted to get the three priorities. And so I think we, we do have more detail, but it's not uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense that it's coming from the entire planning board and it should, but we have three really great members, new members with, that we're very you know, excited about what they may bring uh, ideas and, um, but I, I hear you, uh, Kathy. Thank you, Jack. Christine, did you have anything to add? Um, I wanted to just um, uh, answer some of Kathy's questions. And one of them has to do with the mixed use building. And we do have a good um, mixed use building zoning amendment that is sort of waiting to come back. It was presented to town meeting, um, I'm gonna say, you know, five years ago or more. Um, and we thought it was pretty solid, but 
it went down to defeat because one of the uses that would have been allowed on the ground floor is, um, was parking um, as, w as one of the potential uses. So um, we'd like to bring that back and um, work with the planning board and the CRC to, to refine that and see if we can uh, get that through. Um, Kathy's other question about um, the FPC zone so the FPC zone is a separate issue from um, the flood maps. It's, it's sort of confusing, but the FPC zone is an actual um, zone, zoning district, and it's not an overlay district. Um, it is part of the zoning bylaw. Um, the flood maps are something that is created by FEMA based on um, their analysis of um, the land. And those are the flood insurance rate maps. So that's something that's recognized by the federal government and by the state. And the Conservation Commission also uses it um, to show them where they can expect a hundred year flooding. Um, so it's really a different, um, it's a different animal than the FPC zone, even though FPC is um, somewhat related to the flood maps. So what we're gonna be bringing to you is the flood maps as they're developed by the consultant who's been working with FEMA and with us, and um, a, a text of a zoning bylaw to accompany it, which we now have a, a model of. And then um, we're going to have to figure out what do we do with the FPC zoning district? Um, do we uh, eliminate it? Do we change it to match the, the new flood maps? Um, how do we deal with this? My um, my recommendation would be to um, incorporate the new flood maps as an overlay district within our zoning bylaw. So we could end up with two competing things. We could end up with an overlay district that reflects the 100-year floodplain as defined by FEMA, and we already have our current FPC zoning district. So we have to figure out how to, how to make those work together. But the FEMA maps are kind of sacrosanct, because there's something that's approved by the federal government and it relates to whether people can get flood insurance on their properties. Um, so that's that. And then I think that was with the two questions that I felt I could answer for Kathy. Yeah, those, uh, those were the only two things I zeroed in on. Thank you. Okay. Alyssa. So I'm well aware that we're 50 minutes into this and we haven't actually started talking about priorities yet, but I wanna reflect back to something that was said way back at the beginning by Rob and then Ben associated with structure of the zoning bylaw and Kathy also commented on, you know, the ability of people who've used it in the past to be able to use it moving forward, et cetera. Um, I wanna just point out that, you know, based on my experience, which starts with town meeting in 1999, struggling to manage to work with the zoning bylaw through my work on the master plan, through my work on select board, town council, um, I'm aware as, as we all are, that there are different products out there on the market that can help with things like this in terms of structure. And we struggled to find one that would help us with meeting agendas and minutes, and we've not found one that we can modify to our purposes for that. But the ECODE 360 that's out there in the world associated with zoning bylaw does seem like a structure worth considering. And I bring this up because when I was on bylaw review committee, the second iteration of that, the reason that we were able to make a beautifully linked, beautifully crosswalked, all the things that people talked about earlier in today's conversation document is because Jeff Kravitz spent an immense amount of time working on that in addition to his other responsibilities. Prior to the pandemic, we generally had a fully staffed planning department and nobody had time to do this. And I do not believe that Ben suddenly has time to do this because you know he's not additional personnel. He's just new person, newer personnel. So I would really strongly encourage the town to look at doing this in an electronic fashion rather than trying to come up with some beautifully formatted long word document with links in it. That's, that's not the future. That's not how we need to manage doing this. We need to do this in a more structured way. And that should also simplify all these. Are we using capital letters? Are we using small letters? Buy a structure, put it in there, and let's, and let's move along with that. Thank you, Alyssa. Dorothy. You're gonna need to unmute, Dorothy. 
Okay. I am still confused about the, the BL district. Um, it starts um, near me on Halleck and it goes, you, as it was reiterated re early in this meeting, uh, North and South Prospect. Now in South Prospect, there is a business, but um, there really aren't a businesses to speak of, uh, except at the, at the corners right near Pleasant Street on Halleck, but there are some multiple, there are some apartment buildings, some like garden apartments on Halleck. Um, in other words, kind of transitional to the more residential nature of, of the abutting blocks. Um, and I saw so here, I'm hearing contradictory things. Um, one, build up the BL, and two, whatever you do, it should taper and be a buffer and kind of go slowly into the residential area. So, um, and I mean, I I'm also know that there's many suggestions, many of them good for um, creating some more density in the residential area, the blocks. So I, if somebody could tell me what the ideas or plans are for those areas, um, I mean, if you go on North Prospect, there's a couple of multiple dwellings, but it's mostly private homes. Is the plan to knock down the private homes and build apartment buildings? Um, I mean, there is one at the end at uh, Amity and uh, the Perry's at the corner of Amity and um, North Prospect. I'm, I'm just kind of like, it's been talked about a lot and I have no idea what somebody wants to do or think is wrong with it or has plans for. So this is to Christine, I guess. Christine. To Rob. So there are two separate things going on. One is we're looking at um, chapter 40R. Um, and Chapter 40R is a program that's offered to cities and towns to um, create an overlay zoning district that allows greater density in certain areas um, in uh, exchange for um, the developer agreeing to d design guidelines and mm -hmm. providing affordable housing. Um, so that is a discussion that's been happening kind of outside of the realm of the zoning bylaw. And perhaps you're thinking of that, Ms. Pam, when you're um, talking about the BL zoning district, because that's really the only, quote, proposal that we currently have for BL or BG. And it's not really even a proposal. It's an examination of what might happen if. And it's a process that we're going through, and we're hoping to actually try to wrap it up in the next month or so. Um, we're going to hope to get the consultants to provide us with their best um, suggestions for how a 40R could be um, established in the downtown and BL zoning districts. But then we're going to take that uh, product and say, does this make sense for this location? And if not, could we use this program and have it be built elsewhere like East Amherst Village Center or Pomeroy Village Center. So that's, that's this one track. The other track is that we're looking at um, the dimensional regulations um, in the BL as part of our zoning um, bylaw rewrite. And we have done studies in the past. Um, I'm going to say again, you know, four or five years ago about what we could do in the BL to make it possible to build new housing there. And that is the kind of thing that we're going to be bringing back to the CRC as part of this um, zoning bylaw rewrite. So that's separate from the 40R. The town may well decide that it wants to go in the route of the 40R, but that will be a separate process. And eventually it would have to be um, brought together with zoning, but for right now it's separate. Well, I, I guess I, I could see, um, I hear that we have a lot of, we don't have enough family housing. We certainly don't have enough affordable family housing. And our new buildings that have been going up are not family housing. Um, it is family housing on the majority of, of certainly North Prospect. Um, so I, I just want to re remind everybody that we need family housing. And that is not the most expensive housing in town, by the way. That is, I think, moderate housing that, uh, in that area. Um, which I think increasing moderate housing is a, is, a, is a great thing that we want to do. So if something else is built there, then I guess it should better, better be for families, which is what we haven't been doing. And, and there must be, it must be more expensive to build for families is all I can guess. 
Thank you, Dorothy. Shalini. Hmm. So, um, yeah, thank you everyone for, um, thank you, Mandy Joe, for preparing all of this and compiling all the lists and, um, and everyone else here. So, okay, my, I have two broad questions and then specific ones. So the two broader questions are, I think, directed towards the planning staff and maybe even the planning board members, is what kind of zoning is preventing new businesses from opening and succeeding in our town and uh, for promoting more mixed family housing and for smart growth? So that's the first question. Um, and then the second is what kind of studies have already been done with respect to zoning, you know, which promotes smart growth or have already, because I'm all, it feels like zoning is such a complex issue and we need consultants to tell us how to, to do the zoning conforming with our market, our master plan and our values and goals. And so I was looking up and there's one, for example, the Cecile group had for North Amherst uh, Village Center, form-based zoning. And so like, it seems like there are some studies that were already done with respect to zoning and what are the suggestions that have been made and can we start over there? So those are the two broad ones. Should I stop here and then add more later? Yes, <laughs> let's give them a chance to answer those. Um, yeah. May, uh, yeah, um, so I think there, as far as I'm aware, there aren't um, zoning regulations that are particularly preventing new businesses from starting, except that um, it's hard to find land. Um, mm -hmm. So in the downtown, um, new businesses are, are welcome. In the BG, there's not really anything pre preventing them unless they're, you know, a research um, a company that's doing something that we wouldn't prefer to have in the downtown, in which case they can locate out on University Drive. But one of the difficulties that um, businesses have had, at least in the past, in trying to locate in Amherst is the size of the sites that are available and whether those sites are um, uh, connected to sewer and water. So for instance, there is land up in North Amherst um, in the vicinity of the intersection of Route 116 and Sunderland Road, fairly large tracts of land, um, but those tracts don't have sewer and water connections. So it's been hard to um, develop them in the past. But other than that, other than being able to find, um, you know, the proper land area or to find the proper building, um, I'm not aware of zoning issues that are preventing um, businesses from coming in. I mean, there are things like uh, marijuana businesses that want to come in that may not be appropriately located because mm -hmm. they're, you know, within the proper buffers mm -hmm. and, and that type of thing. Um, with regard to family housing, there's not, um, again, there's, there's not anything that's preventing family housing from being built. Family housing is being built in Amherst Hills and it's being built in Amherst Woods and, um, but those are fairly large houses that are being built. In fact, there are even some houses that, um, one house that was just completed in Echo Hill that is near me. Um, but those properties are expensive. And so when a developer buys an expensive property, he wants to build a house that has a commensurate mm -hmm. um, value so that he can get the value back from having bought the expensive piece of property. So, so that it's really the market that is um, preventing family housing from being built in that way. And family housing in terms of, um, of apartments is another question. And the, the I mean, reason yeah. that, um, that family housing for apartments isn't being constructed is that, um, well, developers go where the market is. And right now the market is um, smaller units for smaller numbers of people, either one or two people who want, you know, a one bedroom unit or they want a studio apartment. That's where the market is. The market isn't really in family housing to provide it for, um, for moderate income families. And so we have to, you know, take responsibility for that. And if we want that type of housing to be built, we have to kind of step in and, um, you know, kind of support it um, the way we supported 
for the way we are supporting 132 Northampton Road. Um, there's an, a move afoot to use the property that the East Street School is on to provide affordable family housing. So that's, that's one opportunity. Um, there, there may be uh, ways that we can rezone some of our land mm -hmm. to um, have smaller lots with smaller houses allowed on them. And that's certainly something that we should look into. Can I do a follow-up question? Yeah. So I do have an email from someone as an example of how the current zoning is limiting or has been has made it harder for this local professional. And this person is zoned in, uh, it's a local professional zoned in a PRP, the Professional and Research Park. And so they wrote that zoning is so restrictive that unless you plan to have a small research lab, you have to go through site plan review, which cost me tens of thousands last time as multiple meetings with engineers, lawyers, architects, etc. It's also designed with the image of a rich corporation who can afford such bureaucracy. Meanwhile, the person who bought the land, which contains a resident, isn't allowed to build residential units because it's PRP. So this plot of land can't really be used by us. So that, I mean, I'm hearing these kind of stories of not big developers, but just small local doctors or dentists or lawyers who are finding it really hard. And so then they go and build, my own neighbor who's a dentist has built in Hadley, the couple have opened there. So what is the perception and, and then exactly like this kind of examples of where we are sending that signal to our local, and I'm not talking about big development at all. I'm talking about just the small spin-offs. I just heard from another person who wants to do an outdoor recreational uh, business. And after talking to some counselors locally and just get talking to the people locally is now turned off and saying, I'm going to, I want to, I'm probably going to open in Hadley because, and this would be an ideal business for us because it's about uh, creating opportunities for families and uh, people to use the outdoors. And uh, so it's like completely consistent with our goals. But, you know, so there is these perceptions and messages that we're sending out. And I feel like as a council and planning board and planning staff and all the staff, we all need to be on the same page. What do we want? And this actually reminds me of an MMA con uh, conference um, uh, workshop that we entered in uh, uh, went for this year and it was by April Anderson and she had an amazing presentation on economic development where she works with towns using smart growth tools and can get funding and whatnot and one of her slides had this question for the town to be clear what do you want to be do you have the buy-in from residents and does the market support your goals and I really feel like we may not be able to answer those questions because I think we know what we want to be, but we're still acting in ways that are contradictory to who we say we want to be. Thank you, Shalini. Um, we're going to move to Steve Schreiber and then we're going to try and pivot the discussion to priorities. Steve. So one of my mantras is that all the parts of Amherst that appear on our website, that appear on postcards, that appear on all the tourism brochures, were all built, designed and built pre-zoning. And all the parts of Amherst that people <laughs> love to complain about were built after zoning. So clearly there's some kind of a disconnect between what we imagine Amherst to imagine or want the character of Amherst to be versus what the zoning bylaw is providing for us. So I think that that disconnect, you know, is, is really essential. So, you know, I read through the list of all the priorities and some of them are, you know, dealing with that. Like, let's get rid of, I happen to live, we happen to live on a property that I think is one of the thinnest sites in Amherst, but at least one of the thinnest sites in RG and it's non-conforming by frontage by a factor of 50%, it's 55 feet in a zone that requires 100 feet. So basically my neighborhood cannot be built 
under current zoning. So I think there's some big existential questions. So that may be beyond our scope of even, you know, even dealing with that. Um, and you know, what's the big question is what do we want Amherst to become? And then there's so many, you know, the, the current zoning has become so complicated that we can throw, you know, ideas at different parts to it, but it still may not achieve the result that we're looking for. But I did want to make, that was all leading to my question about family housing, because I, I think that's a point that Councillor Pam made is a really good one. We have to be careful about how we define family, but I do think of my own, you know, I do think of my own circumstance that I'm here in a single family house in downtown Amherst, and that's fine, but there may be a time that I want to move in even closer to downtown, which is actually, you know, so I'm probably not going to move into a place where I can rent. So I, I'd love to see more ownership opportunities, but that's a little microcosm of that. So not every family wants to live in a single family house. But the other thing is that not every family is like my family, you know, with, there are all kinds of different families that exist here. And we should be also, you know, very welcoming of all kinds of people who, you know, even if they don't, even, even if we don't consider them to be a family, but we should be welcoming of all kinds of people that desire to live in Amherst. So, yeah, we have a lot of work to do and I'm looking forward to the journey. Thank you, Steve. Jack, a quick comment. I'm pretty sure you wanted to answer a question from a while ago. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Steve, uh, Schreiber may remember uh, with regard to Pam's inquiry about the BL area that John Kuhn presented, um, I don't know what project, but it was several years ago, but he essentially gave a presentation how you, you wouldn't really be able to build in kind any of the structures within the BL district. And that's sort of what Steve is saying about his house. And, you know, that to me just, you know, doesn't make, you know, very much sense. <laughs> So that's, that's a big uh, lift that, that is in front of all of us, I guess. So, um, and then I have some other comments, but that, that's, that's, I just wanted to point that out about the BL. Thank you, Jack. Um, we've heard a lot about what the planning department thinks might need to be worked on and that they want to work on. Um, some priorities from the planning board. We've got a list of compiled priorities from many counselors. That list did not include any from the CRC. I had told CRC members they could just bring them to this meeting and we'll add them in later. Um, given what we've heard, what we've read, uh, it would be good to discuss as a council and a body what priorities at this point we might be leaning towards. Dorothy? Okay, so connecting where we've been and where we're going. Um, I'm using a very simple definition of family, which, which I, I know family can be anything, but I'm using one that means it has children in it. A town, a small town, I feel, has to have children. And um, we're losing children, we're using, losing young families, and towns are made up of a lot of people, and I know a lot of people who are, do not have young children at home, don't even have teenagers at home. But you don't want a town that's all that way. We're in a very transitional moment now in the United States. A lot of people who have moved into cities have decided they want to get out of them. And I think a lot of them are going to want to come to Amherst. And we have um, working more increased working at home. We have the internet. And hopefully one of my dreams is that we have town-wide internet, which the town I came from, Norfolk, Connecticut, is working very hard on for the same reason. The town is dying, the number of children in the elementary school is decreasing, and there are people who want to be here. I think, I mean, particularly with what's happening in California right now, uh, I just feel that Amherst is a great place to come, and I'd like to have places for families of all incomes, um, including people who live here in Amherst as renters to be able to become uh, buyers or whatever. So I think that we really have to look ahead and say, what makes a town healthy in the long run? And it includes a lot of things, but it does have to have some families. And that's an area that we're having a problem. So that's what I'm hoping for. Thank you. Thank you Dorothy. Alyssa. Um, 
Melissa, you're muted. Thank you. Um, I understand that this is a new process and I really appreciate how you solicited from all of us and, and also you mentioning that that seven pages doesn't even include the CRC's priorities. I also wanna point out, we don't seem to have a document. Chris kept referring to what the planning board already has ready for us. That's not really covered by the planning board's memo. There's not a list that says, this is ready, this is ready, this is ready, this is ready. So we need that list instead of just having it spoken to us verbally as well as you as CRC is undertaking the masterful task of figuring out how to take that list that has only been provided verbally, the planning board's list of their priorities, the seven page list, the CRC's list. So thanks, good luck. <laughs> thanks Alyssa. Um, I don't see any other hands right now. So before we continue this conversation, we are going to move to the public comment on this. Um, uh, Evan just raised his hand. After Evan, we will move to public comment and then we're going to come back to the council. So Evan. So I guess at CRC was told not to submit our priorities because we would have the opportunity to talk about them. Yes. Um, and so CRC members, so I was, I'm actually hoping that before we go to public comment, the CRC could talk about what we may have brought to the table. Sure. Um, much of which I think is also reflected in that do that lengthy document that was compiled from other counselors. Um, I want to say that sort of my priorities are driven by um, how we can try to make housing more affordable in our community. Um, and I think that means two things. I think that means increasing housing production. And I think that means diversifying our housing stock so that we have lots of different types of housing being produced. Um, and I think for me, the other part, because I often look at these things with a climate lens, is how can we uh, concentrate development um, in already developed areas and how can we concentrate development around transit um, and send a message that we're looking um, to have a sort of post-carbon town um, within the next several decades. So with that, I know that several people have already seen sort of what my priorities are. I know that Chris has a list of them. Um, but I wanted to say for me, number one would be tackling the problem with the BL. It's absolutely absurd to me that we say the BL is a place where you should be able to build multifamily housing and yet the zoning dimensional regulations literally don't allow that to happen. Um, I've also seen John Kuhn's presentation that shows that pretty much everything that's already built in the BL could not be built there under a current zoning. And you, I think when I did the math, it was like 70% of parcels could not support um, even a single unit of housing, never mind more than one unit based on what it is. Um, I think there's a lot of proposals out there to fix it. Um, I, I think my dream would be just to rezone it all as BG um, but I think probably a good interim step would be um, just fixing some of those dimensional regulations. Uh, I also would like to see us try to um, promote more um, multifamily housing of different types. I think part of that's apartments. I think that means we have to think about how can we make it easier to build apartments. Um, I know we don't want to get to specifics, so I'll leave those out, but there is no way that footnote M should continue to exist in our zoning bylaw. Um, and there is no reason that we should continue to have a 24 unit cap on apartments. Uh, I'd like to see us move away from single family zoning and allow duplexes and triplexes by right. And I'd also like to see us allow accessory dwelling units by right. I know those are both things that have been discussed by the zoning subcommittee of the planning board um, and have been discussed by planning department. Um, the last two things I'll say is I wanna support looking at um, parking minimums. Um, I, I, I wanna just echo what Chris said. There is absolutely no reason that a studio or one bedroom unit should be allowed, should be forced to have two parking spaces. That's illogical. It's also completely contradictory to our new climate goals to continue to promote um, uh, parking as a primary use of our land and for, uh, for, for private automobiles. I think we need to look at uh, seriously reducing parking minimums um, for residential development um, and perhaps even reducing them further for residential development that's in close proximity to public transit. If someone has access to a bus 
we don't need to provide as much parking. And the last thing I'll say, um, which was mentioned before, was about increasing density in our village centers and the area around us. I think Steve made a great point about how his his house couldn't be built under current zoning. Um, the, if you look at um, the dimensional regulations for some of the neighborhoods surrounding downtown Northampton, um, and then you look at the dimensional regulations for our RG and RVC district, they're dramatically different. And it doesn't make any sense that we require such large lots for what should be the densest residential districts. Uh, I think all of these can help to improve housing affordability while keeping a lens on climate. Um, and I'm happy that I saw many of those in the councilor comments that were submitted and that I heard many of them um, in Chris's presentation. And so those are the, my priorities that I would like um, to lend my support to all of which I think have already been said. So I don't think these are just things I'm looking at. Thank you, Evan. Um, we're gonna go to Shalini and then see if Sarah and Steve have any comments to add to. Shalini. Uh, I wanted to uh, echo everything that Evan said and also talk about form-based zoning. If that's something that we want to look at and um, yeah, that's all. that's all for now. Thank you, Charlene. Um, Steve or Sarah, would you like to, if, if you have a list, um, provide it? I did not make a list for the reasons stated earlier that the CRC will have many chance for our own priorities to emerge, but in part one of our jobs or the way what we're trying to do here is to look at what our colleagues um, and what the community are, you know, what their priorities are. But I think that's something that I'm particularly interested in is, you know, basically the, the trend where we have existing village centers and in, in the downtown area and um, trying to unlock smart growth in those particular areas. And I agree with a lot of what's been said that I think trying to create a monocultures of certain housing types in the central business district, which is, you, you know, the first few examples that we've seen seem to be some kind of a monoculture, but encouraging a more different kind of mixed use buildings in those areas that may be attractive to um, people who aren't interested in renting, I guess is what I'm saying. So I, I think a particular interest of mine is what do we do to encourage the development of um, multifamily owner occupied housing in the, the downtown area. So the other thing that I find particularly heartbreaking being a UMass employee and often meeting new faculty that are moving to this area is the inability of those new faculty to find housing that works for them. So a lot of them really try to find housing that's within walking distance of the UMass campus and or, or and either it's not available or there's a monoculture being set up in particular housing units. So they end up going across the bridge to the, the, our favorite, Northampton or East Hampton. So, so I would love to have the traffic come the other way. So people move from East Hampton to, to Amherst because Amherst is the cool place to live. Plus you can walk to work if you're a UMass employee or to move from Northampton to Amherst and walk to work take the bus to work. So that's my, those are my priorities. Thank you, Steve. Um, Sarah, do you have anything to add before we move to public comment? Um, yeah, and I wanna say this um, delicately because I, I am very sensitive to the fact that uh, Alyssa Brewer said one time that if you would not appoint someone to planning board, if they're against housing. And um, so I want to say that I didn't write a list this time, not that I'm not interested in zoning, but I am concerned about how we're now starting to go about initiating zoning changes. And I don't feel that an initiating zoning changes should be the job of town councilors. And I realize that is my, just my own um, view, but I guess it feels like a slippery slope that we had an appointments committee that was 
taken apart and we gave it, we gave all of the appointments to different committees, which in and of itself sort of made sense. And it did make sense for CRC to take over planning board and ZBA because we work with them a great deal. But then CRC um, put forth the bylaw to change just, and I realize it's just site plan review from a two thirds vote to uh, three. And then we, um, we, <laughs> one of our questions, we, then we said, we think that CRC said, we think that maybe that um, the zoning changes should then be initiated by town councilors. And for me, it feels like it's sort of taking away from the job of the planning board and the ZBA. Um, and one of the questions even that we, that CRC thought about asking planning board um, interview people was, how do you envision yourself working with the CRC with zoning changes? Mm -hmm. So I just, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with how our process now has, it's all these little things that have sort of accumulated. And I can see where there's a possibility that the things that CRC and town council have done could make zoning changes a lot easier and we could be much more nimble and we could work way more quickly. And I also can see where it could go awry. So I guess at this meeting, I just wanted to say that I have some reservations, but I say that with respect to the counselors on CRC who I really feel like have excellent intentions. And I really don't, I don't want to say much more about it um, because I don't want to take away from the good work of our committee. Thank you, Sarah. We're going to move to public comment. And then I know we have a list of counselors who still want to talk. We will come back to that list when we finish public comment. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, I, if you want to speak at public comment, please raise your hand. I will recognize you in turn. We have approximately, um, we're gonna try for, try to keep it to two to two and a half minutes um, so that we can get back to council discussion too. Um, and I will start with John Page. Please, uh, let, let me work on this. Please unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, John. All right, this is John Page from the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce. I know this is just an initial conversation, so all I want to say is we're viewing this as an opportunity to clean up zoning, um, resolve conflicting or problematic information, and most importantly, to perform some measures to spur economic activity through commercial, residential, and mixed use development in the town of Amherst. Um, personally, I'm really excited to see counselors leading um, on long-term visioning and look forward to working with staff, planning board, and counselors um, on the chamber zoning and planning priorities in the months and maybe years to come. So thank you. Thank you, John. Um, next is Ira Brick. Let me... Okay, so I want to make a few related points. The one is that people have used the word smart growth several times without really defining it. I just want to say there's also the concept of limits to growth. I think that Amherst is filling up quickly and from what I am seeing that there are a lot of people that are trying to move up to the valley from New York and I don't think that there's going to be an end to demand. So we need to figure out when we've run out of supply? When are we becoming a town that's overcrowded? The second point is I have met very few people that think anything positive about the five-story dorms downtown. I'm glad to see in your uh, brain dump that uh, many people are suggesting three stories. I think the five-story is the wrong use and people are saying you can't regulate use but if you build something that acts like a dorm, it's going to be filled with students. I am in favor of building, of the town building a three-story model. Create something that then you say, this is what we want downtown. A couple of you have said, what do we want? 
figure out what we want. What I would like to see is buildings that are one story and, and aging replaced by three stories with uh, service and retail and restaurants on the first floor and apartments and condos there's two stories above those that are attractive and profitable um, for the developer but attractive to families and professionals and i also just want to question the use of the term oops lost him yeah Bill. you can hear me not not no, well. hear you again ira okay can you hear me now yes, yes. okay Form-based zoning, from my reading of it, and I've done a few readings, is build what is like there already. And what I see downtown now is inappropriate five-story dorms and also one-story aging buildings that are nearing being decrepit. And I think five-story form-based zoning is just inviting more of what we don't want. And I think we need to figure out what form we do want and build it so that the use is not inappropriate for who we want. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. Next up is Hilda Greenbaum. Or Greenbaum, sorry. Greenbaum, two E's. Greenbaum, sorry, there's no E in the, in the middle. Sorry about that, Hilda. <laughs> That's okay, but I've been confused for years. When, when they first moved here, I got a telephone call from the Oriental Grub I wanted to know if he could deliver my rugs. And I said, I'll be glad to have them, but they're not mine. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to get back to a couple of things that were mentioned. First, the whole issue of the BL zone, I know is contentious. And if I had my way, we would have put the BL zone along North Pleasant Street as part of the historic district, but people wanted to get the historic district through town meeting and thought the best way to do it was not to put those buildings in. But that's the part of Amherst that I was glad to hear Steve Schreiber say is the postcard part of Amherst. It is a historic district there and they're very charming buildings. and. I thought that there was only one house along there that was conforming as to lot size, but I guess there are a couple more as if they said 70%. But um, I know that there are developers who want to see the east side of North Pleasant Street travel over to the west side of North Pleasant Street all the way to UMass. And I thought we had nipped that in the bud with the gateway when we said, this is not what we want, but we want to try to preserve the historic district as it is because some of us feel that it's worth preserving. And I know that's controversial, but the other thing I want to correct because Evan has said it several times and put it in writing that apartments are limited to 24 units. That's not the complete bylaw, that's only part of it. The buildings may be limited to 24 units, but the building, each building 24 units, but you can have any number of them as long as they fit in the density requirements um, if they're 20 feet apart. And we haven't built any of those at least since the 60s or 70s. But that's, that, that's what the apartment is. You can have more than 24 units, but that's the limit per building. Um, the other thing I'm, con well, I, I agree that we do need family housing here. Gee, there were twice as many kids in school when my kids were in school, and I don't want to tell you how many years ago that was. But this was a town of small families. All these neighborhoods had young kids in them, and now you don't see children no matter any neighborhood you go to. They're, seem to be all big kids, unless you go to a UMass, um, you know, graduate student housing, something like that. But so I think that we do need to find a way to bring the young families back here if we're gonna have vitality of the town and not just be college students and old people, which is what we're getting to be. Um, I had been talking about density for years and years and years. Go, 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 go. What? I'm totally hard. Sorry, Hilda. I did that by accident. I went to hit the I hit the wrong button. So Hilda, please unmute yourself again. Okay. Unmute it. 
Uh, Sorry well, about that. That was that was completely my fault by accident. So continue. As long as you're not shutting me up. No, I didn't mean to at all. Yeah, <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah. So this is getting back to the whole issue of density in the RG unit, RG area. And what happened when um, the Crow Hill apartments on High Street were built, somewhere in there, the, the, the number of square feet per unit was double because the neighborhood didn't want it. So I forget whether it's 250 feet or 200 feet per square unit. Anyway, 2,500 feet per square unit. And I think it went to 4,000. I can't remember the numbers anymore because it's been a long time. But in mm -hmm. any event, that was put in there to cut the density back. And that may be one, of, one place where you want to look. But my argument over the past 20 years has been that units should be it, or density should be determined not by the number of units in the building, but by the number of bedrooms or how many people per square foot or whatever could fit in the building. Because the bylaw would let you build eight bedrooms in a duplex, but it wouldn't let you build eight single family or, or whatever. So the, that, that's an issue that with me goes back a long, long, long time about how you figure out what's a unit and, 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 and what is density and what's the best way to look at it. So that, that's another, another thing that's on my, my list is if we have a zoning bylaw, I'm really concerned about the number of waivers that have been handed out lately. The only place that I can think of offhand, and there are probably others that I haven't used, where in, in the um, parking requirements, if you're near downtown or near a bus stop and you're walkable and all that, then you can have a, a, um, a parking waiver. But otherwise, I don't know in the bylaw how these five-story buildings got to be 60 feet when we have an absolute limit of 50 feet. They got a waiver. And if we're gonna have a bylaw, it seems to be, it ought to be a bylaw that's enforceable. And if a developer comes along and says, I can't afford to put in an elevator unless it's six stories or five stories, and we've heard this one several times, um, then they get the extra, in order to build a building, they get the extra story to pay for that elevator. Um, I don't think this should be. We should decide how high we want the building to be and stick with that and not give somebody that's coming along a waiver. And then this brings up another whole issue since I bought Opportunity Zone and PRP, we were made certain promises when this land was zoned PRP back in 1989 um, that there would be no housing and it would be a very low intensity kind of development. And then the PIP on Route 9 got built with everything that the PRP, does, at least three or four different things that the PRP zone doesn't allow. And so I'm concerned with that as we have some development that's being proposed for the PRP up here. And just to make sure that whatever the bylaw is, it's, it's stringent with regard to what the limits are. And of course, the ZBA can always make things less than the limits to accommodate the abutters, but that hasn't been happening lately. It used to happen all the time in the 80s, but we haven't had that mentality, at least over the last 20 years, that people are not only building to the max, but they're building beyond what the max will, the bylaw will allow. So that's, that's another thing that's on my, uh, on my list of things that if we fix up the bylaw, we, we look into. Then of course, footnote A, if we had a hotel draper that burned down like Northampton had, Northampton is stuck with that little building that was a Newberry's and a Faces, stuck between, you know, the tall late Victorian buildings because their bylaw had changed and the new bylaw wouldn't let them fill in the hole. And, and so that's the kind of situation that footnote A is supposed to deal with. It's not supposed to allow a 60 foot building because it's in the vicinity of a building on Lussie Street three blocks away. And that's another sort of waiver or abuse of what the bylaw really says that, that people have gotten away with over the last few years. That, that if that's what you want, put it in a bylaw. Otherwise, you know, make waivers really only for the 40B that are giving the, the affordable housing or some other incentive. 
and I think I've probably been through a good hunk of my list. I'll yield to somebody else. Thank you, Hilda, and sorry about cutting you off with my wrong mouse click. I'll, I'll cut myself off now. Uh, Meg Gage. Oh, wait, hold on. Am I muted? You, you are good now, I think, Meg. You got me. You unmuted me. I, I'm, yeah. Okay, I think Meg, I, I got too many things going on. Meg, I think you're good to speak now. You can hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you, Mandy. Um, I uh, appreciate all the work that's going into this important conversation about zoning and development, but it seems to me, by, uh, maybe it's where we are, but that it's piecemeal and we're doing it, um, we're doing it piecemeal rather than in the context of a strategy. I think Amherst needs a strategy for economic development. Um, it's like teaching somebody how to play chess by just showing them where the pieces go on the board. Uh, talking about building standards be before we've talked about a building program. Um, sort of dealing with development site by site. Um, I think, I'll just put my cards on the table. I think a strategy for Amherst economic development needs to focus on the arts. Um, there's a whole concept that um, I learned a lot about while I was working on the Amherst Cinema Project called the Creative Economy, uh, where economic, economic development is sparked by cultural activities. North Adams in 1998, the year before Mass MoCA opened, had an eight, over 18% unemployment rate. And now actually, I'm not sure what it is right now with the pandemic, but um, it's not good for the arts to have a pandemic. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it was down to about 4% last year. Um, <clears throat> I feel really, uh, the, the Amherst Cinema Development is a really good example of the kind of partnership you can have with a nonprofit and a for-profit. It's, uh, and it uh, sparks all sorts of other kinds of uh, development. People wonder why did Northampton suddenly become such a cool place to be rather than Amherst? Well, I think it's because they, uh, in the 90s and the early 2000s or whatever we call it, they, there was this huge development of the arts, particularly uh, music and theater. And now that's happening in East Hampton and the magnet has moved toward East Hampton. And I think we could be that same kind of magnet. Um, the arts are, very consistent with an academic community uh, and they're very consistent with zero energy goals. So I just encourage at some point for us to step back and think about what kind of a town do we want and what can we develop that will draw people here uh, the way we want them to and the, uh, the way people spend money in the 21st century and the way they buy things. Thank you. Oh, I just wanna quickly say I totally agree with Hilda that the zoning bylaw should be what we want it to be and not just our opening bid with developers. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. People, I have a lot of more thoughts about the arts, if anybody ever wanted to have that conversation and how, how we can work to fund it without um, the town having to spend a lot of money on it. We raised three and a half million dollars for, for Amherst Cinema. And um, anyway, that's, I'm really in, interested in exploring that further as a way of enhancing our downtown. Okay. Thank you, Meg. Um, next up is Gabrielle Gould. And, oops, hold on. Let's see. You should be able to unmute now, Gabrielle. And can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I just wanna thank you all and reiterate exactly what John Page said earlier. This is going to be um, hopefully many months of conversation. I'm hoping not years because time is of the essence. And I wanted to jump on really to say, Meg Gage, uh, my name is Gabrielle Gould. I work with the bid and I would love to speak with you more about the arts because um, I couldn't agree more. And part of our Downtown Amherst Foundation is going to be to start creating more arts, more performances, and more experiences in order to create economic development for downtown. And that is all. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Gabrielle. Okay. At this time, um, we are going to back to the council. It is almost 345 now. Um, we're gonna try and wrap this up in about the next 10 minutes or so, so that we don't go too far over with CRC. Um, we need to talk a little bit more about priorities. Obviously, we're not gonna finish that talk, but next steps is, is, is also important. I'm gonna start with the list that I have right now, which is, actually, we're gonna start with Andy because he has not spoken yet. Hey, well, well, thank you, uh, Mandy. This has been an excellent meeting, and so thank you for organizing it. Um, I'll be really quick. I first follow an apology to you and the committee because I was late on getting my comments in, and I may, they may not have been included. But on the other hand, I was very pleased to see when I read the summary of comments that all of the themes that I had hit upon as being the important strategies uh, were covered uh, by by my fellow counselors, so I was supporting them, uh, not in any way um, adding or duplicating, a, uh, or I was duplicating, but I wasn't adding, but there was a couple of nuances. But there are three areas that I talked about was, um, one is economic development, which has been brought up, and I came at it as a slightly different angle because of my finance committee role and talked about it as new growth. and. Uh, if the town is going to support the schools and the libraries and the services that we feel are so important, we need to make sure that we have an economically stable base. And uh, so it's not just economic development, but you need new growth in order to have increases in property taxes, which is our one stable control um, form of uh, revenue. And uh, Therefore, um, we have to have new growth, but it's also important for this community to really be thinking about the kind of new growth that is appropriate. And I think a lot of the discussion that I've heard today has to go along those lines. Um, the uh, others was uh, climate and um, energy policies to see where they can be built into um, our zoning um, bylaw, because I think that zoning can encourage certain kinds of development um, that um, will then decrease our carbon footprint. I'm going to that. And the other was the housing question, uh, which is where I'm going to end up so I can be really quick about my comments, uh, knowing the time crunch that uh, you're under. Um, I had started with affordable housing, but I think that the conversation today was talking about a variety of housing that included also family housing, um, which includes some affordable housing issues, but includes other issues too. Um, I think one of the things, because uh, a comment talked about um, criticizing buildings that were built that have ended up encouraging um, some student rentals or a large number of student rentals. I don't know what the real answer to that is, but the reality is, is that we have a lot of student demand on housing. It is gobbling up our neighborhoods. I think that we all know that um, there are um, houses that have, were family houses that have been converted to student housing and um, that takes away housing opportunities. And if we don't create some kind of housing that's appropriate for students, um, that phenomenon will continue and it runs counter to the goal of family of creating family housing opportunities. And then there was, um, and I'm going to conclude by saying that there are two kinds of zoning that we put into our zoning uh, bylaw with the idea of encouraging things to happen. And um, I think that uh, both of them have not um, fulfilled the vision. One is the PRP, which was previously mentioned. Um, I don't think that the PRPs have um, so far uh, created the kind of development that was envisioned at the time. And the other one is cluster housing. And this goes back to something that um, when I was a member of CRC, we talked about a little bit because there is a cluster housing provision, but it hasn't resulted in the development of much of the housing that we were uh, wanting to encourage when that provision was created. 
And uh, so those kinds of existing uh, bylaws need to be examined as to why, because if you don't create housing that encourages developers to develop what you want, there's something wrong with what you designed. So I'll leave it at that and thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, Kathy. I'm going to try to just build on some other comments. Um, you know, Mandy, you very artfully combined everything we put in. Um, some of us, and I don't know how well I did it, did a memo that tried to be in context. You know, so when I'm reading through, I say, well, this goes with this, this doesn't. So just a couple of comments. Um, Andy picked up on something that Steve had said, you know, you, young professors or new to town can't find housing. That's because, you know, if I knock on the doors along Van Meter, there's a whole neighborhood where I knew all the new professors in town, they all lived there. When I was uh, campaigning, those were student houses with one exception, you know, in neighborhoods that had been all, what we would have called started homes, one, two bedroom homes. So it's, we have an overflow coming from UMass that we can't, probably can't build fast enough to get out of without some control on that end. And I believe Dartmouth at one point committed to putting dorms on campus, you know, on trying to think of user space. So we do have a demand driving some of what we're seeing built. So I worry with our vision of what we want to become if we open up new space, allow more density, what stops that mm -hmm. from turning into what Steve called a monoculture? You know, uh, you know, unless we say what we would like there um, and somehow say these are the kinds of things we're encouraging you to build. So that's this vision of where we want to go. This second thing, um, just on listening to this, the word smart growth, um, and Shell and I have, have started trying to exchange articles I was looking at our walkability um, meeting, public space. It's not built into our zoning law very much on if you're building something big next to a narrow street, do you have to worry about its height? How far from the curb should it be? And when you look at examples of smart growth, so I put in my piece, Aurora, Colorado, they said, look at the street width, step back from the curb, regardless of what the public way currently is, but say you want a sidewalk that's six feet wide so two wheelchairs can pass, and some green space or maybe more cement, but that's so people can sit there and meet with each other. So we need that kind of vision if we move out to village centers too. So if we're building up, and they say, think about the building across the street, only built high enough if the building if the street is wide. So we've got these little narrow streets in some parts of town and we create tunnels when we build too close to them. So the smart growth people are saying as we expand, think of the second story steps back a little bit so it doesn't cast shadows. We move it back from the curb a bit so we can have um, enough passing. And I found one town that said our public way is very narrow. The pre-existing little sidewalk is narrow. If you wanna go up another story, give us some of your land, you know, just move it back. So it was, and then Andy picked up on um, solar and conservation. There were some smart growth towns that were doing that in their new development. And we don't have much land is what Chris also said. There's not a lot of land that can be developed that's not developed yet. Um, so if we're redeveloping land, but they were saying same thing in some of their places where it was saying only two stories high. If you build to an energy code that's very strict, we'll give you another story. If you get a lot of points, we'll give you another story. And doing it as an incentive system. Um, and so we could say, we want to get to zero net on if new larger buildings are coming in. And I thought it was a creative way of getting mixed buildings. And the architects like Steve would have to say, how do we avoid a monoculture? You know, How do we have a vision of the master plan of some mixes and then but not stop all development and Meg's idea about the arts. Is that the first floor? Does every new village center have a performing arts space? You know, because we don't have old factories like East Hampton does that we can just renovate. You know, we're stuck with beautiful Amherst, but it doesn't have warehouses. It doesn't have the old industrial. So I do think we have to start a little bit with the master plan. What could we be where with a vision of what we want? And then what's stopping us from getting there? 
and worry about market forces. You know, if you open up something, the market will give you, they'll build on every inch, um, you know, because if you can. So we need to think about where we want to go before we um, uh, exceed to growth. And then my final comment on new growth is I've said this before and I need to prove it. New growth does not always yield net income for the town in terms of finances. We sometimes spend on roads, on sewer, on water, on schools as much as that new unit that came into town. So we do need to think about the problems of the larger urban areas that they, no matter how fast they grow, it's not fast enough. So we need to be really able to say, do we want green space? Do we want, um, Evan, someone sent me your dissertation, you know, talking about a place for the rainwater to fall off into some green space around our buildings. Um, we need to be thinking about that when we're building. We just can't cover every little piece and say, oh, but uh, five miles away, there's a park. I mean, we need to be worried about our housing developments as well. So I'll just stop there because it's a vision. It's a visioning. And then what's stopping us from getting there? And what could we do if we go slowly? Thank you, Kathy. Dorothy. Well, I think she mentioned a lot of the themes that are going through my head, which is that we need an integrated plan for downtown. We can't just have things happening next to each other because what we want downtown is we want lots of little pieces of green space. It's not enough to say, well, we've got a common here and we've got Kendrick Park here. Okay. Those are nice. Those are great. And I love them, but there have to, has to be um, both private and commonly shared green space, even around an apartment place so that people can actually go outside and stand somewhere or do something. We need to think about balconies on apartments. Um, I may have mentioned this, but you know, here we are stuck in our homes. If you happen to live in a house with a yard, you're a lucky person. Uh, my son is living in an apartment in Washington, DC. He has a balcony. The balcony has saved his life, his sanity. Um, we need to think about that. So we need green space downtown around in many places, some of it which is connected to the residents of the building, some of which is shared, which means setbacks on the buildings. And it means the green strip with benches and which people who are walking by, because we're talking about walkable streets and some of those streets aren't very walkable right now. So the arts, well, we do have, uh, Shalini talked about going to an uh, MMA convention. I remember the workshop on fire stations and I discovered to my great joy that town after town, in Massachusetts has turned their fire station into an art center. And I just saw it, what a great place, it's right downtown. Once we move them, get that new and built, and you have the theater, and you have workshops and rehearsals, and you have other business spaces, and you have restaurants in that building right downtown. So we, there's lots of things that we can do, but we, we have to have a, a good coordinated plan because if you talk about density and developing downtown, really, we have to work so that it's not just filled with dorms because they're not bringing the town, the vitality that we've been talking about. Um, and I'm glad that Andy mentioned cluster housing again. Um, I'm very interested in uh, plans of housing which have a lot of shared green and a little bit of private green, but has the housing, smaller units, closer together, perhaps attached um, in ways to not just have the single house stuck in a, the, the, you know, the green lot, um, even though that is nice, but that's not where we're gonna go if we wanna build affordable family housing. Because as has been pointed out, the new homes that are being built are ones that are very expensive. I, I read my little Amherst, who sold what to whom every day, and you know the values are going up, not down. So thank you for uh, the work that's going on, and I'm hoping that we can get a kind of unified vision that we share that we share and then figure out how to get the zoning code to reflect that so that we are making a code that makes it clear what is our vision of the town and this is how it is. And so it's not all waivers and exceptions and kind of randomness. Um, it'll be much easier to build a beautiful Amherst that way. Thank you, Dorothy. Evan. Yeah, so I just, uh, I talked very specific before and I want to broaden in just a moment. Um, I think it was, I'm losing track now, but I think it might have been Hilda who said we want this to be a community that isn't just 
uh, college students and old people, and, and I can uh, support that statement. Um, I, I'm a bit of a unicorn in that I am a person who is in his 30s who has chosen to live in Amherst. There are very few of us here, and any of you who want to talk about why, I have a lot of opinions about why there are so few people in their 30s in Amherst. And it also takes me a lot to, on a public meeting, admit that I'm in my 30s. So, uh, anyways. Um, one of the ways if we actually want to have generational diversity in this community um, is we have thousands of young people who come to our community every year and then they leave. And so if we actually want generational diversity, the best way to achieve that is actually to try to keep some of those graduates here so they set down roots. And, and this is going to lead to something that I, I want to send a message to my fellow counselor is that if we want to do that we have to show students when they are here that they are welcome here and that we want them to stay and i say that because in the suggestions that were put forth that mandy compiled and in some of the discussion today there is a lot of anti-student sentiment and it really does concern me for example please stop calling the downtown developments dorms. They are not dorms. That is infantilizing to the adult residents who live in those apartments and honestly insulting to the non-students who live in them. But it also sends a message that we don't want students downtown. I saw other comments that said things like um, have developers, um, commit developers to developing um, housing that is for non undergraduates that kind of language tells students we don't want you in our communities we want you here to support our local businesses but we want you to stay on campus and that is not the type of atmosphere or language that's going to convince young people to stay in our community when they graduate and so i want us to be very careful about the message we're sending i understand the challenges that are posed by having a large student population when it comes to housing but when we turn our solutions towards things that are literally discriminatory against students, things like trying to reduce the number of unrelated people who can be in a house, things like saying we have to have housing that we say from the outset is not for undergraduates, things like calling anything that has students in them dorms, that sends the wrong message. And I don't think that's going to achieve what we want. If we want generational diversity here, it's not just about having housing for the new professors. It's about getting the people who come here to stay here. And when we have these conversations and we talk about how can we prevent students from being in our communities, that's going to do the opposite. And so I hope we can really think about how we're using language and how we're having these conversations as we talk about zoning. Thank you, Evan. Um, we're going to hear from Alyssa and then Steve, and then we're going to wrap up this portion of the meeting. Thank you. I'm just trying to understand what we're doing process wise. You know, that's the question I'm always going to ask. We heard from a couple of counselors who aren't on the CRC at great length about their campaign speeches about the things they're interested in doing. And I would have been happy to give one of those too, but we don't want to be here for another hour. And so I would just like CRC to have some time, which you now don't have because it's after four o'clock to discuss how can you incorporate not only the that we gave you, which several of us touched on relatively briefly, others at great length. Also give the public another opportunity to talk about that. Just what's the process moving forward? That's what I would like you to have the time to be able to discuss. Thank you, Alyssa. Steve? And I'll be really brief because actually Evan hit on most of the things that I was going to say, but we, if I look at the grid of who's here, both us, the council plus the public, we also are a kind of a monoculture here, right? So there probably aren't any residents of those buildings that everyone likes to call, or no, that many people like to call dorms. They're not here, but have any, any of us met them? The answer is yes, I have. I have friends that live in those buildings and they most definitely are not residents of dorms. So um, I think it's really easy to other, you know, to other, um, groups if you don't feel that they're part of the conversation, but why don't we welcome them into the conversation, the people that live in the, the five-story buildings, and let's hear why they move there and what they, how are they contributing to the town? How are they contributing to the life of the town? 
And I think you'll all be surprised. Thank you, Steve. To address Alyssa's comment, we will probably get to that at our very next CRC meeting since we run out of time today to really get to that. I will summarize a little bit more as we talk about next agenda preview at the CRC portion of this meeting. Um, at this time, I'm going to move to item number four, which is items not anticipated. I don't have any. Uh, Lynn, do you have any? No. Um, so that means we are moving on to item, I think it's it's ability for the town council to adjourn that would be lynn that would be you doing that um unless others want to stay i'm going to adjourn the full town council meeting and say several of us really don't need to be here unless you're going to talk about when you are going to be doing what that we might want to join next yeah, so we'll get to that at the next agenda preview. I'm not going to kick anyone off this meeting, um, but but it will be a discussion of when our next meetings are because we have to set a schedule first and then what will be on those meetings. So that will happen at item number 10 um, on the agenda. And then I will fully update the whole council on once CRC decides what those items are. Okay, so uh, those that are on the council but not on CRC Basically, uh, we're welcome to stay, but we're now audience. Thank you. But I'm not moving you over to audience just for now, because <laughs> it'll take too long. So yeah. town council is adjourned at 404. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the rest of the CRC agenda. The next is general public comment. Is there any public here that would have any general public comment at this time? Um, before we move on to action items, I see one hand. Um, I'm going to recognize Hilda Greenbaum. There was just one item that I, I forgot to mention, and that's the issue of if you want apartments, the apartments require that no more than half the units be of one size. Therefore, that means that to build an apartment building with 24 units in the building, there has to be a mix of sizes. They can be ones and twos, but you can't have more than half of one kind. So it, it, it almost requires you to put a couple of threes in there somewhere. Now, one, other, one of the big loopholes with the mixed use, which is why people are going that route, is that they, they don't have that requirement of mixing the sizes of the units. And then um, another issue that, that, that came up in town meeting, which I pointed out, you can have a mixed use building by just opening up an ATM machine or putting a washing machine open to the public in the building and then it's a mixed use building. So it's just a giant loophole for any developer to walk through to get the maximum of the units as small as they might be into the you know, the, the size of the space that they have with, with, without many constraints on it. So that's something that needs to be looked at. If you want family housing, then you've got to make the mixed use buildings comply a little in some way with the apartment bylaw where you have to have a different size units. You can't have more than half of one kind. So I just want to put that out there. Thank you, Hilda. Um, there is no more public comment at this time, so we will move on to action items, fall 2020 meeting times. Um, everyone has seen the schedule in the um, packet. Uh, is there any discussion or requested changes to that schedule? I am not seeing any hands. Um, so the schedule moves us hopefully off of the Finance Committee Tuesday meetings was the goal. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to do that. Um, I will acknowledge that there is a December 29th meeting. I will hope to be able to cancel that. Um, but I put it in there so it's on our schedules. Um, it goes through the end of January. Um, if, uh, if there are no other requested changes, um, I will take a motion to adopt this amended schedule. Evan, Shalini, Steve? Uh, so moved. <laughs> Thank you, Evan. <laughs> Do I hear a second? <laughs> 
I'll second. Steve seconds. Is there any additional discussion? Seeing none, I will go through the roll call. By the way, Sarah had to leave uh, by 4.05. Um, she had an issue with some family obligations so um, that she couldn't stay any longer, but she was also okay with the schedule. Um, so we are not, she'll be fine with it. So roll call, we start with Evan. Yes. Steve. Yes. Melanie. Yes. And Mandy is a yes. That is a 4-0 vote adopted with one absent at this time. Um, moving on, we have minutes. Are there any, we have three sets of minutes, the August 26th, 2020, 5 p.m. meeting, the August 26th, 2020, 6 p.m. meeting, and the September 1, 2020 meeting. Um, I have been through them and the revisions, suggested revisions from that for clarification purposes are in the packet. Um, I will go through them quickly. I did not have any for the September 1st meeting. Um, for the August 26th meeting at 5 p.m., I just wanted to list the candidates that were interviewed in the others participating remotely. I added the announcements as none, um, and I fixed a verb tense. Uh, is there any other requested changes to the 5 p.m. meeting minutes? for the August 26th meeting. I am seeing none. We'll go to the 6 p.m. minutes. And those, I spelled Mr. Burt Whistles. I corrected the spelling of his name one time. It happened to be wrong. And then I cleared up a sentence on the second, the third page that read, Maria Chow and Jack Jemsick are the most senior members, have served less than three years and their terms are up in two years. I corrected that too. They are the most senior members, have served around three to four years each, and their terms are up in two years um, because I remembered myself saying that I wasn't sure exactly how long they had been on, but it was around that time. And then there was one other um, change of just a Scrivener change. Any other requested changes to the uh, 6 p.m. meeting minutes for, October, for ugh, August 26th? I see none. Are there any requested changes to the September 1st meeting minutes? I will then take a, well, I will make the motion to make it easier to adopt the August 26, 2020 minutes as a 5 p.m. meeting as amended, the August 26, 2020 min minutes 6 p.m. meeting as amended, and the September 1st, 2020 minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Steve seconds that. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we will start with Steve. Aye. Uh, Shalini. Yes. Mandy is yes. Evan. Yes. They are all adopted. Um, announcements. Uh, I just want to say thank you to, I know they've all left by now, um, but thank you to everyone that came today to present and all. Um, next. Yeah, we will obviously be continuing this. Um, any other announcements from anyone else? We will go to next agenda preview. Um, our next meeting, let me make sure I get the date right now that we just changed meeting dates, is September 29th. Um, at that meeting, we will be discussing housing, comprehensive housing policy, and we will also be discussing zoning. Um, as for zoning, um, I think we'll take the conversation we had today, we'll take the compiled document, um, we'll add any priorities that any CRC members wish to add and any that I've received by email from um, other counselors that didn't quite make the deadline last time into that document. I also hope to sort of do an executive summary that pulls out large, broad topics to help um, help us have that conversation about where counselors might be focusing energy or might want energy focused. And so that will be the zoning side, um, housing. Uh, I am in the middle of drafting a document as we agreed to last meeting um, that brings in the goals 
that we had talked about at the last meeting. Um, I hope to have that to everyone early next week in a packet so that people have time to review it. Um, but it won't come in till next week. Are there any other agenda items? Oh, and there's one other thing. We will, it's gonna be a busy meeting. Um, we want to discuss before we completely forget it, the appointment process that we just went through um, and how we might be able to make it better if we think we can make it better or not. Um, any changes we might want to make to it, I guess is the better way to say it. Um, go through with how we thought it worked and, and if there's anything we want to change or not. Um, so that will also be on the agenda. Um, so it's gonna be a busy meeting. Anything else from anyone? Ashalini. Just a quick question about the process, the appointment process. Are, are we just, so we're gonna share from our perspective what we observe and think, but do we want to talk to people who went through the process or what's the goal of that? I mean, yeah, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I, I can reach out to the candidates that went through the process and see if they have anything they would like to add um, suggest what their thoughts are. Um, I, I can certainly do that. Um, I have received some brief comments that were not specific um, just shortly after, but, but I will reach out to all the candidates that went through the whole process to see if they have any suggestions or comments regarding it since it was our first time going through this process. Um, is there anyone else people would like me to reach out to? So I will do that. Um, any other comments on next agenda or agenda previews? Seeing none, thank you for the extra 15 minutes. I appreciate it. Um, with that, we will adjourn at 4.15 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.